The year is 2002. Under cover of night, your parents have taken you to a seedy shop no child should ever be allowed to enter. GameStop. You're a young gamer, and your father, a seasoned games aficionado, has decided the family ought to step into the console age. The PlayStation 2 is rung up and paid for, but with it comes a tough decision. Your dad and brother have already made their choice of games for the bundle, but as a kid with a latent internet addiction, you don't know a damn thing about what console games you might want to play. A stack of options is presented in front of you, and as a budding devotee of the gothic subculture, your eyes focus on one phrase. Shadow King. You just know it has to be perfect for your grade school occult tastes, and so you make your choice. In the following weeks and months, you try it, but you don't understand RPGs. You keep trying, keep failing, rage quit, and eventually realize the game has been lost by the time you go to pick it back up. But it always stuck with you. The player guide. The art. No amount of time can seem to erase from your mind that one game. Okage. Shadow King. Okay, before we dive into the mystery which has plagued my life for two decades, I have to talk about Okage. Because this game is niche, at least in American markets. I've never met anyone in the wild who has played it, and even Google searches bring up paltry results, with less than a handful of dedicated fans to note. Googling Okage brings up 91,000 results. For reference, Undertale brings up 69, nice, million. Even Battletoads brings up three million. Now, I would be remiss not to mention that this game was originally released in Japan under the title Boku to Mao, literally me and the Demon King. And if you google the kanji for that, you actually get almost eight million results. Even googling the romaji of that name nets you four million results. Side note, I'm going to keep referring to the game throughout this video as Okage Shadow King, because I don't want to risk incessantly mispronouncing Boku to Mao, just know that it's named differently overseas. I'm going to talk later on in this video about my investigations into the Japanese-speaking fandom around this game, but for now, I can only tell you that I do not speak or read Japanese. I can only confidently say that, from what I've seen, the English-speaking fandom for this game is minuscule, and that might be why my questions went unanswered for so long. Okage Shadow King is a PS2-exclusive, turn-based RPG developed by Xenoworks and released in the US in October of 2001. In the game, you play as Ari, a boy whose main trait is that he is entirely unremarkable. Which, I mean, relatable. Ari lives in a run-down graveyard mansion outside of the nearby village with his historical enthusiast father, stay-at-home mother, grandparents, and younger sister. One day, Ari's father finds a strange bottle and believes it to be an important historical artifact. According to legend, 300 years prior, half of the world had been destroyed by the great evil king Goma. This destruction only came to an end when he was defeated by the hero Hopkins. It is speculated that a scholar named Pollock then sealed the remnants of Goma in a bottle. Ari's family, rightfully, is skeptical about this being the particular bottle, especially as the legend has faded into obscurity, and as such they go about their lives. Until that night, when Ari's sister, Annie, is attacked by a ghost on her way home. Upon returning her to their house, 
Annie is seen and cleared by a doctor, but despite her physical well-being, it is quickly discovered that she has been cursed by the ghost to only speak in pig Latin. Iste ise viosiobe convinientine. The family fears that if the curse is not lifted, Annie will be doomed to the worst fate imaginable to a woman, being a comic relief character. In the midst of all this, the bottle awakens and out emerges James, the demonic assistant to the evil king, with the proposition. In exchange for removing the curse on Annie, a member of the family will need to offer up their shadow as a vessel for the weakened reincarnation of the evil king. Ari, already being easily overshadowed, is determined to be the perfect candidate, and Annie is cured, with the harmless side effect that her shadow is now pink. Which, I mean, at least she's not funny, am I right, fellas? And so we meet Goma's reincarnation, the great and terrifying Stan. Emerging from his imprisonment, he realizes in his absence other people in the world have been leeching his powers away. He thereby orders that Ari take him on a journey to find and defeat these fake evil kings in order to reclaim his full power and corporeal form. We finish up our tutorial phase of the game by heading to the nearby village, where a water shortage has everyone in a panic. Heading to the basement of the local church, we find that the water supply has been shut off and is being guarded by a ghost. We defeat it in our first battle of the game, saving the town, and then we set off on our journey to find and defeat the other evil kings. And this is where I have to admit something embarrassing. This was where my first playthrough of Okage ended. Why? Well, because I was six. Even at this age, I played plenty of games, but they were all on the computer, point-and-click adventure type stuff like Monkey Island, Broken Sword, and Day of the Tentacle. The PS2 was my first console, and while I loved being able to move around in the 3D space, for some reason I just couldn't really wrap my head around being able to control the camera. Because I couldn't seem to get the hang of controlling the camera, I kept running into ghosts, and I wasn't skilled enough to survive multiple encounters. So I kept dying, and eventually I just rage quit. By the time I actually tried to return to the game, I'd lost the disc. But Okage didn't just leave my mind. You see, one of the beautiful things about buying an early PS2 game is you open up the case and there would always be a little game manual inside. When I get nostalgic for a time before DRM and downloading everything, little packaging touches like these game manuals are some of the things I miss the most. Information wasn't so widespread online in 2001, and any tutorials you put into the game also eat up your disk space. So, to help save some space, developers could package more detailed instructions with the game itself. And if you still don't know what to do? <laughs> that sucks! Buy the strategy guide, scrub lord! <laughs> Fun fact, I actually looked into buying the strategy guide for this video specifically because the ad says it includes original artwork from the design team, and if so, I really want to see that, but all the listings I could find were like $50, and I'm not monetized, so... Plus, I couldn't find any pictures online of what the artwork entails besides this one. I don't even know if it's any different from the concept art on the wiki. Uh, if you happen to have this strategy guide and you're feeling generous, uh, maybe drop me an Imgur link in the comments. I'd appreciate it. Since there was a strong chance that players would take at least a cursory glance at the manual, any creator worth their salt would add a little visual flair. Part of the visual flair for the Okage manual was bits of concept art scattered in the margins. And this... This is where our mystery begins. I was captivated. The art style of Okage, both on paper and within the game, grabbed a hold of me, and I have never known peace since. As the processing power of consoles improves with each generation, I've grown frankly exhausted by continuous efforts to make games that are visually true to life. I can't pretend that I wasn't absolutely enamored with Lady Demetresque in Resident Evil Village. Obviously, I want her to step on me. but. As a video game character, 
Personally, I just don't feel the same connection to characters that aren't heavily stylized. I mean, if I could make connections with real people, I wouldn't have a games addiction or mountains of therapy bills. I would be remiss not to point out that I'm fairly certain Okage's appearance is due in no small part to the limitations the game was made under. While I cannot find any concrete numbers regarding the budget for the game, I do know it was made by a notably small team. Game development is often rife with budgeting issues, and while a team at Xenoworks did have support from Sony, a new IP probably didn't warrant the sort of big numbers required for top-of-the-line modeling and animation in 1999. Regardless of what brought about the stylistic choices made when developing the game, I have to say the design ethos is overwhelmingly endearing to me. I would definitely liken it to the fondness people have for games like Psychonauts. In fact, people looking over my shoulder as I replayed Okage for this video kept asking if I was playing Psychonauts. It's not that the games look particularly similar, I'd argue that we're just not used to seeing 3D video games lean so heavily into shape-heavy, cartoony aesthetics nowadays. At least, outside of Nintendo. I've heard Psychonauts described as, it should be ugly, but it isn't. And I think what people are trying to describe there is stylistic harmony. Everything from the characters to the items to the settings all looks like it belongs to the same world. When a style is consistent throughout an entire body of work, it reaffirms the intentionality of all the choices made. You're able to take in the game as a whole without even really questioning it, because under the world's established visual rules, everything just makes sense. For a simple example of when this idea isn't present, let's have a look at Yandere Simulator. It's well known that the developer of the game doesn't know how to create and rig 3D assets. Which is fine. You don't have to be a virtuoso in all facets of game creation in order to produce a serviceable or even good product. Purchasing assets is a perfectly viable solution. Hell, big game studios do it too. However, if you don't have a dedicated artist and art director, you can easily end up with a game whose assets are all visually pretty on their own, but don't come together to create a cohesive world. As the only good Australian puts it, the game looks uh, shit. It looks bad. Like it just, it looks bad. Not so much graphically, which I'll get into later, but more stylistically, because there's no theme, there's no aesthetic, no nothing. It's just a bunch of objects thrown together, which is very, very obvious when uh, you know that all the students like use the same base model and that base model doesn't really like fit with the trees that they spawn right next to because the trees look like they're out of like Morrowind or something and the characters don't. All this to say, I find Okage to be a masterclass in stylistic consistency. The designs for the characters and enemies are cute and visually interesting on their own, but within the context of the game and world they live in, they're elevated to a level of visual escapism that I think most games ought to strive for. I can do nothing but sing praise of Tsutomo Sekimoto's work as the art director of Okage. I can do nothing because I can't fucking find him. Fuck. <sighs> okay, I'm okay. In spite of having not finished the game initially, I love the artwork present in the manual so much that I sought out other drawings from the same artist. As a child of the internet, my search began pretty much as soon as I was allowed to use Google. Okage Shadow King is, from what I can see, Tsutomo's only art directing credit. However, he did work on the art for other games prior to 2001. If you're only looking at the English-speaking internet, then you'll see that he worked on Space Gun and Super Soccer Champ, which released in 1990 and 1991, respectively. However, if you are, as I am, insane, and have spent 20 years incessantly googling his name and the kanji it is written with, you will also discover that he created the character art used in the 1999 Super Famicom RPG, 
Little Master Rainbow Magic Stone. This was the third installment in the series, which, from what I can gather, never saw an official English release. Xenoworks also developed the previous two installments, but I didn't see Sutomo listed in the credits for those. And that's it! After 2001, I couldn't find a single game Sutomo was credited on. I checked the credits of other Xenoworks titles to no avail. I went to various game cataloging websites and even his IMDb page. All to the same three results. I couldn't even find any social media presence. I checked Pixiv, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, DeviantArt, Tumblr, Bebo, Fur Affinity, and nothing. Early into my search, I didn't even know about Little Master, and given that Space Gun and Super Soccer Champ are both pixelated games of a very different playstyle from Okage, it sort of felt like he had created all these amazing drawings for Okage and then just disappeared. Investigations. When I say that I've been searching for this artist for 20 years, I have to add a bit of a disclaimer. This was never an intensive daily or even monthly search. I'm a visual artist myself, so the bulk of my social feeds consists of other artists posting their work. About every four to six months, I'd come across a drawing that reminded me in some way of Okage. From there, I'd suddenly get overwhelmingly nostalgic and be sent into a two-day-long, fervent scouring of the internet for any new crumbs of information. What's changed since the time my investigation started is that I'm a YouTuber now, which means that the last time this frenzy hit me, I instantly saw content. The thing is, I figured it would seem a little hollow for me to redouble my efforts to find this artist given that I did not finish the game. If I'm going to make a video, I want to make it the best I possibly can, so in tandem with increasing the scope of my search, I reordered Okage, dusted off my PlayStation 2, and set out to finally finish the game. Picking the game back up, I was embarrassed by how quickly I blew through the tutorial phase six-year-old May had spent months on. The part that I never got past was right at the start of Chapter 2 in the game. Enter the pink hero and her parasol. You say goodbye to everyone in town, initiate a few side quests, and get a magical map that gives you hints throughout the game of where the nearest imposter Shadow King ought to be. You're told of a self-proclaimed sewer evil king who has taken over the sewers of the nearby town Madrill, and you set off to right this problem. Cordoned off towns and the insides of buildings are safe but anything in between those is infested with ghosts that will continuously hunt you down. Early on your way to Madrill, Ari is flanked on all sides by a ghost. Thankfully, he is saved by the passing hero, Rosalyn. She gives you your first sword, as you've been swinging a stick around up until this point, and runs off. On our way to Madrill, our path is also blocked by an eccentric scientist, who introduces himself to us before also fucking off. I'm not going to go beat for beat on the entire plot of the game, but as you might have guessed, these two will eventually become our first two party members. This first section as a whole also gives you the basic rundown of the gameplay loop that will continue throughout. Okage is an active time battle RPG, a style similar to that of Final Fantasy. The gameplay is very similar to a classic turn-based RPG, the difference being that instead of characters performing actions in a set order, each character has their own action bar, which fills up faster depending on that character's agility stat. The result is that characters with high agility can perform multiple actions in the same amount of time that it takes one low agility character to perform a single action. When you strip it down to its bare mechanics, I wouldn't say Okage did anything particularly groundbreaking, but that's not to say that it isn't fun. I had an absolute blast playing this. Even if you're not familiar with this type of game, I'd still recommend Okage because I think it's just masterfully executed. The basic gameplay loop is this. You hear about an evil king you need to defeat. You travel to the area it's currently influencing. 
On the way, you meet either the evil king themselves or a future party member. Sometimes these are one and the same. You typically do some story-based puzzle or task and gain access to the dungeon location. Each dungeon, except for the last, has multiple floors with multiple urns on each floor. Each dungeon has a unique layout, puzzle, or other gimmick to add some skill to finding the urns. Defeating the urns in battle destroys them, and once all the urns on the floor are destroyed, the next floor unlocks. Clearing every floor leads to the bottom where the boss encounter occurs. From here, the cycle repeats, with the main objective being to defeat all seven fake evil kings. I hope you're ready for a long section, because here's where I talk about what I liked about the game. Obviously, this video is being driven by my obsessive love for the visuals, and I will mention plenty more things later, but I absolutely have to gush about the visuals first. This game is gorgeous. I don't care how dated these graphics get, these settings are a masterpiece. And the creature design? You could sell any one of these as a custom plush on Etsy and people would go wild. The girlies would be losing their absolute minds sharing that shit. And these characters? It, it, here's a fun game. Tell me what you think this character is like. Why don't you tell me what you think this character is like? At a glance, what do you think this character is like? Do you think a bubbly, vapid, aspiring pop star? A theatrical, mysterious wizard? A young princess with an unpleasant attitude? This is beautiful design language. Ideally, a character's design should communicate something about their personality or the world they live in. The design can even be intentionally contrasting to the character's personality in order to subvert expectations or add comedic effect. But critically, this still provides information to the viewer. Every character in Okage, from your party to your rivals to basic NPCs, tells you who they are, or at least who they're trying to be, at a glance. This isn't just a static observation, either. The characters each have their own unique set of animations. Ari swings his sword around like an excited teenager, notably inexperienced. Linda's run is so cute and ridiculous, I can't help but feel like this is how I look while trying to run in platform sandals. Epros floats around everywhere, and each of his attacks has a dramatic buildup that just makes them feel epic. There's even cute details like how he falls after the exhaustion of his soul-binding move, or how he's the only character with some semblance of shame if you choose to run from a battle. Pretty much every cutscene features Stan devolving into a flailing rage, and something about it is always funny to me. He's supposed to be the ultimate form of evil in the world, and he's flapping his arms like he just heard the most absurd shit in the Discord argument and can't even begin to respond. An important part of the design ethos is shape language. A basic principle of design is that basic shapes elicit different emotions in viewers. As such, you want to incorporate shapes into a character's design that appropriately showcase their role or personality. And Okage really isn't afraid to get impossible with their designs. This man can't breathe, this man has hydrocephaly, and this man is a Pokemon. Even in our main cast of characters, we have quite the peculiar bunch. Certain games have an issue wherein good design is neglected in favor of pretty design. Looking at you, Final Fantasy XV. Not Okage. Take a look at Kissling, the second party member you'll get. We go from 22-year-old anime girl with a sword to 45-year-old scientist with crazy eyes. Even though a wide range of faces and body shapes are shown, what's important is that all these characters look like they belong to the same world. Patterns and colors are used across multiple characters, and similar shapes can be found in their surroundings. Imagine if Tim Burton weren't allergic to color, or light. I wrote that as a joke, but while typing this, I actually realized Nightmare Before Christmas might have been some source of visual inspiration. Apparently, I'm not the only person to have noticed this. 
I haven't found anything explicitly stating that as a source of inspiration, but it seems worth noting that Nightmare Before Christmas did come out eight years prior to Okage. That's a huge appeal for me, honestly. A criticism I've often had of other gothic-style works is that they seem too afraid to implement lighting or color. This criticism also extends to visual media getting increasingly gray in an attempt to communicate bleakness. I'm frankly just burnt out on it. I'm bored. I want something more to look at than grays and blues. I'm depressed enough. And it's a crutch anyway! Color can be a very powerful way to set an atmosphere, but if you don't have the writing or style to back it up, you end up with a world that always seems dissonant from the story it's telling. Speaking of which, the world building in Okage is really impressive in its subtlety. This is something I'm struggling to put into words because it's something you just experience over the 30 plus hours you spend playing, but... Okay, here goes. Spoiler warning up ahead, I'll put a timestamp here if you'd like to skip this part. This game is honestly amazing, so I totally understand if you want to go in as blind as possible. Because the visuals are all on the more cartoony side, you go in unguarded and just naturally take in your surroundings on their own terms. Yeah, the people look a little weird, but so do you. It's odd that you live in a graveyard, but that's not unheard of. There are ghosts running around, but I mean... It's a game, you gotta have enemies, and it's okay anyways. Certain people are classed as heroes and are trained to handle these kinds of threats. Ari's dad actually works in the town hall where people's classifications are received. You don't get a clear answer as to who does the assigning, but hey, bureaucracy, am I right? Even the princess of the land shows up personally to confront one of the evil kings. Which seems dangerous, this is a literal child and a primary member of the royalty, but what could- Oops, she's been kidnapped. Obviously, you have to go save her. So, you make your way to the ancient, partially submerged aquatic ruins... Is that fucking Big Ben? Technically, this is never directly acknowledged. The game is so cute and endearing that you really just enjoy the ride as it takes you along. What's going on might seem obvious or overtly strange when I just list things out, but by this point, you've already been playing for several hours. You've seen so many cute and funny interactions between Ari, his family, Stan, and your other party members, as well as all the NPCs, that you just feel a comfortable sense of mundanity in this world. I have to admit, seeing a mostly submerged Big Ben referred to as ruins, really was the first time I raised an eyebrow. From this point on, I wondered if this was a world separate from our own, or a future where London had been wiped off the earth. Hopefully the latter! While playing Okage, I'm reminded of the old adage, always leave them wanting more. By speaking with NPCs throughout the various towns, you get glimpses of this world's history. But the narrative is never halted for some overindulgent lore dumping. Ultimately, it just doesn't matter to the story we're playing. As outsiders controlling a character, maybe we care about this world's history. But Ari? He's a teenage boy, out on his own for the first time, and very focused on ending his current servitude. Best of all, if you're a miserable completionist, such as myself, you actually do get a much clearer view of the world by the end. If you want, you absolutely could burn through this game in a very straightforward way. Certain parts of the story require brief dialogues and puzzles to progress, but most of the NPCs and buildings don't require you to interact with them at all. One of my favorite little easter eggs involves a string of dialogue between three NPCs in different locations, and requires the player to complete the game's longest side quest. The best part is, speaking to any of these NPCs alone is fairly trifling. Each one of them is trying and failing to tell you a joke. It seems to be more of just a running gag. However, by the time it's possible to complete the unrelated side quests, there's already been a big reveal in the story. 
Finishing the side quest unlocks an additional dialogue with the character who gave you your reward. If you were persistent enough to exhaust all the previous dialogue options, you may have pieced together the bulk of the joke. You may have even noticed some similarities between it and the story you've now learned. The final dialogue at this quest point reveals that the joke cannot be completed. The punchline has been intentionally wiped from living memory. The people trying to tell it to you all know it's a joke, and know it therefore must be funny. And so they laugh regardless. While Chapter 5 in particular hits you with the biggest plot reveal in the game, the world itself and the people you speak to have been dropping hints all along. There's just so much else going on that they don't raise an alarm. Aside from plot significance, dialogue from characters changes even in old areas you've theoretically completed. While there aren't really day and night cycles, you get a sense of time passing as people catch word of your achievements and acknowledge you differently when you return. Most areas never really lose prominence because you continue to go back to them, and the respective shopkeeps stock different items. Speaking of the towns, there's a small detail that I'd like to point out. You can enter most anywhere. Buildings with a single, unimportant NPC, empty rooms, quest points that are no longer active or relevant. The only area that this isn't the case is a town with a very specific lore reason. I know this would probably be annoying for some players, it is arguably wasted space, but given that I never really felt stuck and traveling wasn't overly tedious, I honestly felt that it just added to the charm. Something about doors that can't be opened and buildings that serve only as facades just really bothers me in a 3D game. I think part of the reason young me kept trying to play this, even though I didn't understand the game, was because running around the town in Ari's home just felt like exploring a dollhouse. When it comes to progressing, the gameplay is structured in such a way as to not inhibit casual players from enjoying the story, while still rewarding players who would like to engage more with the combat system. This is because the crucial enemies in each dungeon are actually the weakest relative to the ghosts around them. Regardless, they drop the highest proportional in-game currency. The player still has to navigate the dungeon, evading ghosts if they'd rather not engage, but any encounter triggered can be retreated from with a guaranteed success and minimal punishment. That being said, players who wish to make their way through the dungeon more directly, skipping the somewhat annoying process of avoiding ghosts, can still do so. Battling the ghosts in the dungeons will still level the party up faster and yield more item drops. Even so, the urns in each dungeon seem to reward the most experience relative to their level. So, if you're only battling the urns, you will be leveled up enough for the next portion of the story by the time you reach the boss. My one caveat for anyone who isn't so interested in the story and would rather just focus on the combat is that skipping dialogue will most certainly hamstring yourself. I don't personally see this as a critique because I'm a weirdo who reads in-game books if they're available, but I have known people who chronically skip every bit of dialogue in games to just get to the fighting. Most dungeons and bosses have their own quirks about how to get through them, and usually the only way to know what they are is to read signs or pay attention to what characters are saying. You could trial and error it, but because this game uses save points, every defeat is a greater loss of time and progress. Going against an area or boss's intended strategy isn't impossible by any means, it will just be more difficult. Epros straight up tells you before his fight that he doesn't possess a corporeal form. Hence, he's immune to physical attacks. If you bring a team with no available magic, you probably can chip away at him with some magic items you've picked up along the way, but... <sighs> Look, I'm just not that kind of masochist. You do you. I've just spoken quite a lot about how everything, from the visuals to the words to the gameplay, feels lovingly crafted to create a living, breathing world. The final thing I'd like to praise in this section is the soundtrack. This soundtrack fucking slaps. It fucks severely. The soundtrack, which was composed by Pika Soul Plus, is beautiful and complex and all kinds of descriptors that are better left to someone besides me because I don't know the first thing about music. All I can tell you is how listening to each part made me feel, and 
Boy, did it have me feeling. First of all, you load up the game, and the title screen fades in, and you are greeted by what? The fucking bagpipes! Can we get a moment to appreciate the fucking bagpipes? Number one most underrated instrument right there. The real MVP of underrated instruments. I need more bagpipes in music. True story real quick here. When I was in college, I rented an apartment next to a nice row of houses. I was in the throes of quite the unshakable depression, and after many sleepless nights, I would walk out onto the balcony to contemplate deleting my own save file. However, on many of those misty early mornings, though I could not see them through the mountain fog, one of my neighbors would go outside and play the bagpipes. Let me tell you, every single morning that happened, I looked out into the impenetrable fog and I said, not today. Not today. <laughs> this song is called Emotional Universe and <laughs> it starts out almost somber, sounding a bit antiquated, unfamiliar, yet it quickly picks up as the pipes come in and by the time the drums are introduced you are pumped. And then it fades, coming back more metered, more controlled, working itself back up to that height. What I find most impressive about the music for each area is how seamlessly it slips into the mood it wishes to convey. You're running through the fields and it's bright and cheery. The dungeons give a sense of sneaking around, caution, like you're in an old Scooby-Doo episode. The cutscene as you encounter the final boss features a song with a noticeable techno beat to it, something that is completely unique to this scene. It's so unexpected that it jolts you into attention. Even if you weren't paying too much attention to the music thus far, it's so unexpected as to feel unnatural. You instantly know shit's going down. A big standout from this OST is the melody from the box. An important item to the plot is a music box given to Ari by his mother. The jingle of the music box is played when it comes out in the story, and later on when you're walking by a mysterious building. The song it plays is beautiful and haunting in a way that I lack the words to describe. It's only two minutes, so I'll leave a link to it in the pinned comment. I certainly think it's worth a listen. Okay, okay. I've waxed lyrically long enough. It's time for some criticisms. Number one. Curses are introduced so late in the game and so infrequently that you end up not remembering what their symbols mean. Some of the symbols are clear as to the curse they represent, yet at least half of them aren't, which is ironic for a game so visually fluent otherwise. This is mitigated by simply having the manual within arm's reach while playing. There aren't any timed sections which would require you to make an uninformed snap decision. Still, it does get pretty tedious. Number two. In my opinion, the element system wasn't well implemented, and its order should have been reversed. In Okage, each enemy and party member, except for Ari and the final boss, is attuned to an element. Kind of. This is communicated in-game by a color appearing next to their name. Blue for ice, red for fire, yellow for thunder. Checking the manual, we see that fire is weak to ice, ice to thunder, and thunder to fire. While this is maybe a me problem, I could not for the life of me keep this straight in my head. This is the only game I've ever played where fire is weak to ice. Honestly, just switch those two and it'll be fine. I just couldn't get it through my head that ice beats fire, and eventually I just stuck a sticky note with the element triangle next to my screen. That being said, it's hard to gather what the significance of a character's element even is. While you can use items and gear to improve your party member's stats, you can't really spec your party members. Every few levels, your character learns a new predetermined special move, 
and these specials never vary. The only attack Rosalind can learn at level 9 is Frost. The only attack Big Bull can learn at level 36 is Fire, so on and so forth. Depending on your own tastes, this might seem a little stifling, but you do eventually have characters of each element, and their element allows you to somewhat predict what specials they'll gain as they level up. The first special Rosalind learns after joining the party is Frost, as she has the Ice element. Big Bull is Fire, and he first learns Flame Knuckles. Epros, the other Fire character, also quickly learns Red Mask. Except Psyche! Most of that was complete bullshit and don't believe everything you hear on YouTube because you never know when sickos like me are out making videos. Rosalind does start leveling up with Frost, but the first special Big Bull a fire character gains is Cold Knuckles, an ice attack. Also, Epros, my beloved wandering wizard, is a thunder character. He never learns any thunder attacks whatsoever, but he does get a fire and an ice attack for some reason. I understand that this is helpful to the versatility of your party. Ari, who is neutral, must always be in your party, and you only have two other slots, so you can never have a party with all three elements. Since you can't see what enemies you'll be fighting until you're already engaged in battle, and switching party members has the added tedium of needing to go back to an inn, you want all your characters to have at least some offensive use regardless of whatever enemies you encounter. The wiki for the game asserts that each party member's element affects the amount of damage they take from enemies, as well as the amount of damage they inflict with their normal attacks. The most I can say is that the manual and the game itself are not clear about this. Elemental special attacks have animations showcasing the element at play. Notably, none of your party members' standard attack animations show any indication that they're not just melee attacks. Except for Epros, who doesn't show an elemental influence, but does look like he's reading you a particularly savage horoscope. What's worse is that the manual does advise you to use attacks that are effective against an enemy's elemental base, and since that implied selecting an attack, I assume that meant all specials, when appropriately noted, benefited from elemental bonuses. Not so! You see, as I unfortunately learned during the difficult battle with Epros, who is immune to all melee attacks, Ari's specials, like Blaze Sword and Friendly Thunder, are all melee attacks. It seems that if your enemy is not immune to melee, then the elemental aspect of Ari's specials may become relevant again, but I honestly couldn't tell for sure. Overall, the elemental attunement of party members and enemies felt like something I couldn't rely on while also being something I couldn't ignore. Ultimately, I feel there was some wasted potential there. And number three, evading ghosts gets pretty annoying, especially in dungeons. When a ghost touches you, a short cutscene plays and battle begins. While it is short, it's unskippable, and if you choose to run away, the game still loads up a fight summary, which eats up more time. Since ghosts pursue you all throughout the dungeons, which may have puzzling layouts, it gets irritating running away from them while also trying to figure out where the next urn is or how to unlock the lower floor. Sometimes you'll be running from a pack of them and one will just spawn right next to you, and they move at a similar speed to Ari, so if you don't quickly change directions, you're entering a battle. I've been told there's a similar problem in Pokemon games, none of which I've ever played, and that it's avoided with a repellent item. No such item exists in Okage, and I think it would have been a useful addition. Number four, my last criticism, is that the late game suffers from some pacing issues that ultimately do the most damage to Marlene and my favorite character, Epros. The pacing of chapters 1 through 4 is pretty consistent, with each chapter focusing primarily on finding and defeating the next possible Evil King. Chapter 5 just goes right off the rails. And I love it, even if I can acknowledge that it's not ideal. Chapter 5 is massive, unquestionably the biggest chapter in the game. You start out with a complete break from formula, 
an odd puzzle that sees you separated from your party, exploring a strange new town, and completing a somewhat unique task to progress. I've heard mixed receptions on this specific part of the game. I loved it, but I've also seen people say it was boring, so to each their own. It certainly is dialogue heavy. Once this section of the chapter is finished, we get a monumental cutscene for the story. From here, we return to Formula with a new area and new evil king to fight. My man, my beloved, wandering wizard, Epros. Um, Epros's dungeon has nine floors. Prior to this, the longest dungeon was four floors. Maybe five if I'm misremembering, but, um, certainly not nine. I gotta be honest here, there just isn't enough variety here to justify nine floors. The layouts even repeat, which is baffling to me. The final floor has a riddle, which requires you to backtrack a few floors up. I could see this being intended to add some flair to the end of the dungeon, however, when you just slogged through nine floors only to find out you're gonna have to run back, go up a few levels, and then run through again, all while evading ghosts. It's just a chore. Additionally, you don't even fight Epros at the end of this dungeon. Completing it gives you a key to unlock the tower where Epros is waiting. He's widely considered to be the hardest boss in the game, which I can certainly attest to. I was defeated a couple times, and when I did beat him, it took quite a while due to all available magic attacks at this point being pretty weak. I did feel quite accomplished once I put that overgrown theater kid in his place, and it was a great way to wrap up Chapter 5. From there, I was immediately transported to the next area, which is great because after that I desperately wanted to save my game. The weird thing is, the innkeeper won't let you save yet. He's busy. That's alright, I'll just check out the town a little. Eventually it gets dark and I figure that's my cue to go save my game. Side note, saving your game at a diary heals your whole party, but saving your game at an inn does not. If you want to heal everyone before saving, you have to rest at the inn first. I hate having a save file without my party at full health, so I went ahead and hit rest here. Once you do that, the save option is removed! From here, I entered a cutscene that leads directly into the next boss fight. I died! Which put me right back before the fight with Epros. Okay. Technically, I could have backtracked once I got to the new town to find a save point. Maybe I should have known that resting here would trigger a cutscene instead of healing my party like it does at every other inn. Frankly, I just don't think this was very intuitive. And after charging through a nine-floor dungeon and a long, long fight with Epros, I was thoroughly frustrated here. Plus, it's just a complete shock to be thrown into another boss battle at this point. No dungeon precedes it, hence no save diary before it engages. I have to wonder if Epros's dungeon was so long precisely because the evil king that follows him doesn't have one, but if that's the case, I honestly think it wouldn't have been a loss to just cut it down. Focusing more on Epros, when he joins the party he is level 40 and has one special ability, which is a support move. This is congruent with every other party member we've gained, as they all start with an equal level to what can be expected of the player and with one available special ability. However, in practice, this makes using Epros a functional sacrifice when he first joins the party. By level 40, other available characters have as many as 9 special abilities in their kit. Worse yet, Epros' special, Soul Binding, is a support skill that does not immediately aid the player in battle. 
If an enemy has already been weakened to 10% HP, the skill can convert them to an item drop instead of currency. While this is a useful late game skill, I found myself not really doing much with Epros until I managed to level him up further, which is disappointing because he's honestly a very impressive enemy to go up against. He just isn't as impressive once you get a hold of him. Beautiful wizards aside, I really enjoyed the final chapter of the game, Chapter 7. Oh yeah, by the way, that one boss you fight after Epros? Yeah, that's all of Chapter 6. Defeating him moves you right into Chapter 7. I could ponder as to why that is, but instead I'm just going to follow the game's example and move along. I don't have any critiques to levy against the pacing of the final chapter, as I feel it lasted about as long as I would have wanted it to. However, in spite of the ending being thoroughly satisfying for all of our characters, I wish I'd gotten to see more of Marlene. It's a bit of a pithy critique, but given that she's largely absent from the second half of the game, I would have enjoyed being able to interact with her a bit more in the end. That's pretty much it for my criticisms of the game, although... I can't think of where else to put this. Okay, so here's something I only embarrassingly found out recently. Uh, just so you know, nothing in the game outside of the title screen ever uses the word Okage. I always figured that if I completed the game, I'd figure out why it was called that. Not so. In the midst of some obscene use of Google Translate, I discovered that Okage roughly slash incorrectly translates to Shadow King. The English title of the game is Shadow King, Shadow King. Do with that what you will. My experience finishing Okage now as an adult was, honestly, an absolute delight. It was so vindicating to finally play this game all the way through and discover that I love it. Not just because of the art, not just because of some drawings I fixated on, but because Boku to Mao is a fun game worth playing. Even though it might not appeal to everyone, I just found it endlessly endearing. There's so much more to it that I could talk about, but more than that, I just hope more people find it and give it a chance. It's currently available on the PlayStation Store, or if you still have a working PS2 like I do, copies are cheap and readily available on eBay. I don't have, I think I left it downstairs, but I'm pretty sure that this is a completely unused copy that I got off of eBay, because when I opened it up, it actually had an advertisement for me to sign up for a PlayStation magazine, um, which I don't think is in print anymore. I am not going to endorse circumventing those official means. Given my history, it's probably apparent that I'm not someone to emulate. You guys are smart. I trust that if you want to play this game, you'll find a way. If you decide to pick it up, here are a few hints from me. Your dialogue choices may seem ineffectual, but the game actually keeps track of them. The choices you make will end up deciding which bonus item you get towards the end. None of them are particularly bad, but if you'd like to aim for one specific, you can read about the possibilities on the wiki. If you buy meat from the butcher on the first day, he'll buy it back from you for more money on the second. Always lowball the researchers, it doesn't make a difference. Finally, the last riddle in the ciphertext side quest is a pun in the original Japanese, which does not translate over to English. Pay attention to what the woman giving you the final cipher says, as this text is the only hint to the solution. Or just look it up. When you're done with the game, come back and leave me a comment telling me what you thought. Was there something else you wish I'd mentioned? Have you ever met anyone in the wild who's also played it? After 20 years, I'm really itching to talk about this with other people. The search for Sutomu Sakimoto. So, we're back here. With the game completed, I felt justified in reopening my search for Okage's art director. 
Earlier, I walked you through the process of my previous searches and what that yielded me. This time, I knew I had to find him. I had to go beyond what I'd tried before and exhaust every avenue until I got some sort of answer. And I did. I started by crawling through everything I already knew. The official Wikipedia, Moby Games credit pages, the Okage Shadow King wiki. Pages upon pages of Google results. Carl Doonan has a tweet I've seen multiple times at this point in which he also praised Tsutomo Sekimoto's work and wonders what became of him. You can bet your ass as soon as this video goes up, I'm tweeting it to him and I am so excited. Carl Doonan and Hanai Obi are the only people I've found mentioning Tsutomo Sekimoto on English Twitter. I have previously searched for the kanji of his name. However, given that I don't speak or read Japanese, there wasn't much I could do with these results. Things improved with time, though. When I was a kid, Google Translate was practically useless. It was a joke. Nowadays, well, it's not perfect by any means. But it can translate text well enough to read, and that's a start. I downloaded a browser extension to automatically translate whole pages and got to work. Japanese Wikipedia yielded a dead link to what I can only assume used to be an entry on him. I wasn't able to find any official social media, and as I scrolled through results, I began to find, to my own surprise, that it was mostly just more of the same. Japanese language versions of games credit pages fan communities for old titles. What was different, however, was when I searched Twitter. I want to reiterate to you that in my 20 years of knowing about Okage, I never met a single person organically who had ever heard of the game. My love for this art has always been a lonely one. Now I want you to try and imagine how it felt when I searched Twitter for Tsutomu Sekimoto and thanks to a translator, I was able to read these. I like the character of Boko Tamao, so I regularly search for Sekimoto Tsutomu, but the name was mentioned in Dragon Quest a few years ago, and I don't have any other information. I wonder if there will be a resale of it. Especially Tsutomu Sekimoto, the character designer. I want to see more, but I can't find any other credited works, even though it's so cute. I love character designer Satumo Sekimoto's drawings, but it's a shame I can't see them outside of this game. Searching for traces of Tsutomo Sekimoto has become a kind of romance. I really like the worldview of Boko Tamao. I wonder if there will be a sequel. I wonder if Mr. Tsutomo Sekimoto, the character designer, doesn't have any other work. The design is excellent, so I want an art book. I wonder what Tsutomo Sekimoto, the character designer for Boko Tamao, is doing right now. I want to see more of his art, and, if anything, I want to master his art style. I wonder if Mr. Tsutomo Sekimoto, the character designer for Boko Tamao, is still active. Even if I look into it, I can't find it in the middle of the day. Is there such a thing in such a convenient time? I hope Tsutomo Sekimoto is in good health. The character design of Boko Tamao is excellent. If you have other work or an art book, I want it. There are more. I'll just spare you and put them up on the screen now. I am not ashamed to say that when I first discovered this, I shed a tear. Whenever there's a piece of information I can't find, I always default to assuming that I'm the problem. It's easiest for me to believe that there's always just something I'm missing. For years now, I was convinced that there must be a wealth of work from this creator that I just couldn't find. There had to be something I was missing, something I'd foolishly overlooked. There wasn't. It wasn't even such a strange thing that I'd seen this game and thought to look for the artist. I wasn't alone in wanting to see more. This was something truly comforting to find out. Another discovery was that, at least around the time of October 2012, he may have had a Pixiv account, Pixiv being a Japanese art sharing platform. A tweet from another user in October of 2015 seems to back this up while also stating that the account is no longer visible. I wasn't able to completely verify if this account really existed in any official capacity. 
Regardless, I couldn't find any archived works from it anyways. My next effort was looking further into Zener works. A team of just 17 people at Zener developed Boku to Mao, and while that sounds like development hell, we can infer that this group of people may have been closer knit than other development studios. You can actually see in the credits for Okage that many of the people working at Zener took on multiple roles, which strengthens this theory. The reason this is important is because, from what I can gather, Zener overall is a fairly small company. Therefore, if I could directly contact Zener through their business email, the chances of me reaching someone who knows who I'm talking about are much higher. It's far less likely that I'll wind up emailing a customer service agent in an entirely different part of the world. Unfortunately, I hit another wall here. Zener seems to be in the midst of a lawsuit. I don't fully understand the details, and it's not relevant here. Businesses are constantly embroiled in legal action, and unfortunately, since Zener is a smaller company, it seems that this has driven them to a state of low activity online. I sent off an email to their contact address, but I understandably didn't hear back. Realizing that the direct line of contact was unlikely to pan out, I tried searching for active social media accounts of the board members, to little avail. While many modern game developers have an active online presence, it is by no means a requirement. It's understandable and arguably wiser for a person to want to exist more privately. I'd like to address the elephant in the room here, which is that part of the reason I was searching so fervently for Tsutomu Sekimoto is because his utter lack of presence online had led some to speculate that he had died. And... I have to admit, it was a possibility that had crossed my mind. While I was ultimately hoping to find any work that he had done following Boku to Mao, I was also just looking for confirmation that he was still alive. At this point, things were looking pretty bleak. Every credit I could find for Tsutomu was from his work at Zener. Without a reply from them, I didn't really know who else to look at or where else to check. Despondent, and with no sense of direction, I decided to busy myself with researching how Okage was developed. I stumbled upon a Japanese website focusing on advice for people interested in IT jobs. Back in 2014, they posted an interview with one of the founding members of Xenoworks. This is where I get to introduce the hero of our story. The person who gave this interview. Yasushi Takeda, a.k.a. Onitama. Reading this interview gave me information about Okage that I'd never heard before. I had seen Onitama in the credits before. He was the coding director. However, up until this point, I hadn't known that he was one of the founders at Xenoworks. Previously, I'd been hesitant to contact anyone from the coding side of development, since that can sometimes be very separate from the art department. But as I previously stated, Zener had quite the small team working on Okage, and so the separation likely wasn't as broad as I'd once feared. Additionally, this was the most recent interview I could find from anyone on the development team. Hence, he seemed like the most likely person I could potentially reach. I searched his name, and... He has a website, an active YouTube channel, a Twitter, and most importantly his YouTube listed an email address. I am sweating. I am nervous. I am on the edge of my seat. After 20 years, I might be on the brink of an answer. And all I have to do is write an email to someone undoubtedly smarter than me. The concept terrifies me, but I am desperate, okay? I can't make this video without an answer, and if it means that I'll have to potentially embarrass myself, then I have to take that chance. Onitama's social media and website are largely in Japanese, and I worried that it would be rude of me to try and contact him in English. So, in spite of me knowing that it would be riddled with cringeworthy flaws, I composed my initial email in Google Translate, and after an inordinate amount of research and double-checking, this is what I sent. Dear Sir, I use language translation software. Sorry if it's hard to understand. 
I can only understand English, but I have a question. I've been looking for an answer for years, but I can't seem to find any information. May I ask you a few questions about Boku to Mao? Thank you very much for your time. My name is and I make videos for YouTube. And by the time I woke up the next morning, he'd responded. Hi, thanks for your email. You can write in English. I'll answer if it is something I know. Onitawa. Thank you so much for responding. If you don't mind, some questions I wanted to ask are... I read that the game was originally being developed for the Panasonic M2. So, in total, how long was the game in development for? Hi. You know so much about it. I am glad you were looking into this game very deeply. As for the answer to your question, I can only speak from my perspective as a programmer. This is a personal answer that has nothing to do with Sony or Xenoworks that own the rights to the content. An RPG was initially considered as a product for M2. However, what we actually started developing was an action puzzle game, which was a completely different game. There is no connection between the M2 and Boca to Mount. What kind of changes to the game had to be made when reworking it from the PlayStation to the PlayStation 2? I know that must have been a huge undertaking, and I'm curious about how different the PlayStation version was from the PlayStation 2. The title plan for PlayStation was quite different from Boca to Mao. It was developed, prototyped maps and characters, and actually worked. But soon after, it was restarted for PlayStation 2. At that time, the scenario and characters were all newly constructed. Was there anything you remember wanting to put in the game that couldn't be added? Initially, Boca to Mao was supposed to contain more stories and maps. But since we were working with a very limited number of people, all the work took a long time, and eventually our plans were scaled back. The real plan was to release it at the same time as the launch of the PlayStation 2 in Japan. The US version of Kage Shadow King was decided to be released after the game was completed, so we were able to make a few improvements during the translation process. I played Boku to Mao, Okage Shadow King here in the US, as a child. The game has stuck with me for my entire life. Finally, I really want to ask if you know what became of Tsutomu Sekimoto. He's listed in the credits as the art director. Over the past 20 years, I've sometimes tried to search for more of his artwork, but I've never been able to find it. His work at Zener is all anyone can find. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there are people on Twitter like me asking where to find his artwork. It feels like quite the mystery. I don't want to bother anyone who would rather be left alone. I just really love the art that went into the game, and I hope everyone involved is still happy and doing well. Thank you for your time. Boku to Mao was our first PlayStation game, and it was also the first to be released outside of Japan. We are very happy that 20 years have passed and people still like this game. The core members who worked on this game, including myself, are still with Xenoworks Inc. Of course, Tsutomo Sekimoto is doing well. He is an artist, but he also worked as a game designer and director. Unfortunately, he is not in charge of character design these days. I think the little master series he was involved with before Boku to Mao provided the most pictures. He also did some designs for an indie game made in 2009. I hope to see more of his work in the future. Thank you. Onitama. Thank you so much for your response. I'm really happy you're still working in the industry. You've been a huge help. I did a ton of research since I planned to make a video on the game, and I should be able to do so now. My channel is very small, but I'll make sure to send you a link when it's done. That's it. That's the answer I've been looking for all this time. I have to take a second once again to thank Onitama for responding so kindly to my emails. This video would not have been possible had he not done so. According to that interview I mentioned, he's been making games for a very long time, and as someone who loves to play them, it really warms my heart to see people who have spent a lifetime in this industry. I also got to learn even more about a game I truly love. It seems like development was, at times, unpredictable, but in spite of that, something memorable was still created. I'm happy to hear the core team are still at Xenerworks, and I hope I get to see more from them in the future. Lastly, I have to admit I'm a little sad to hear Tsutomo Sekimoto is no longer in charge of character designs. Regardless, I'm satisfied to hear he's still out there and doing well. I love his artwork dearly, and I hope I can hear more about his work in the future, whether that be drawings, design, or directing. While I didn't find a vast untapped repository of work, I did find a game I'd have never known about otherwise, Tekken Scan.
The credits for this game seem to all be aliases, but according to Onitama, Sutomu did some of the designs. It's such a relief to finally have an answer. In the meantime, if you like the artwork in Okage and you're hungry for something similar, here are a few artists I'd like to recommend. Hajime Ueda is a Japanese manga artist who is most well known for creating the manga adaptation of Fuli Kuli. When I was searching for Tsutomu Sugimoto, I found several people speculating that this was just an early pen name for Hajime Ueda, since Tsutomu was difficult to find. They are most certainly different people, and their respective styles are not identical, but I understand how people drew such a connection. Regardless, he has a larger body of artwork to go through if you're interested. Colot on Tumblr and Twitter draws amazing creatures that have a sharp goofiness I feel is so reminiscent of the enemies in Okage. He also plays with shape and color in such an expressive way I just find myself staring at his designs. There's also Eliza Lane who creates artwork and pottery that's often cute with a more gothic style twist. Even if there isn't more Okage artwork out there for me to find, there are still wonderful artists creating new things every day, and I'm sure they'd love your support. As I'm wrapping this up, I want to take a moment to talk about what I hope you gained from watching this video. I'm not talking about Tsutomu Sekimoto here. I'm talking about you. In the modern era, it's very easy to find people whose skills seem to far surpass your own. It's easy to put your work out there and to be disheartened when it doesn't get a response. But if you've ever put anything creative out there and you find yourself discouraged, wondering if it's worth continuing, know that there might be someone out there like me. It might be years down the line or it might have already happened without your knowledge, but at any time, someone could stumble across your work and carry it with them for the rest of their lives. Concept art, in the margins of a manual for a game I initially hadn't even finished, has stuck with me for so long that I searched for the artist for years to find more. Your work might never have a large following, but if you enjoy doing it and you want to put it out there, it might just mean something to one person. And I think that's enough. Hi there, and thanks for watching. This video took a long time, and it's definitely my biggest project to date. As I was editing, I kept thinking of other things I wanted to say. I actually totally forgot to mention in my criticisms that the game does have chugging and frame rate issues. It was a big problem for me early on, but then I went and changed a whole bunch of my settings, and it stopped being an issue. Regardless, that was a huge oversight on my part, and I'm sorry. If you made it this far, please consider subscribing. I'm getting more into the workflow of making videos, and I have a lot of ideas coming up. If you're feeling ultra generous, maybe share it around. Anyways, I hope to see you in the next one.